So only one more second before you can speak. <laughs> uh, so that I can introduce Lisa. Uh, Lisa Nakamura is professor in the Department of American Cultures and the Department of, Sc of Screen Arts and Cultures at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. She is the author of four books on digital media and identity, including Digitizing Race, Visual Cultures of the Internet. Digitizing Race won the uh, 2010 Association of Asian American Studies Book Award in Cultural Studies. Her other books include Cybertypes, Race, Ethnicity, and Identity on the Internet, Race After the Internet, co-edited with Peter Chow White, and Race in Cyberspace, co-edited with Coco and uh, Rodman. A prolific writer, she has written too many journal articles and book chapters for me to list here, but I uh, will mention just a few that have been influential in my thinking. A few shout outs, if you, if you will, if you can give shout outs to another person's articles, <laughs> I will do so. <laughs> and these works include Digital Media in Cinema Journal, uh, Don't Hate the Player, Hate the Game, The Racialization of Labor in World of Warcraft, and one of my personal favorites, Pregnant Sims, Avatars, and the Visual Culture of Motherhood on the Web. From the selected and impressive lists, you may correctly surmise that her fields of interest and research areas include digital media theory, digital game studies, ethnic studies, feminist theory, film and television studies, science and technology studies, and race and gender and new media. So basically, she's in the right place here today. <laughs> On a personal note, as someone who is animated about these areas of study, partly because, and I really hate to use a cliched term like this, but it's true, so here it goes, uh, because of pioneers in the field, uh, like Dr. Nakamura, um, who was one of the first to write about these things at a time when there wasn't anything called new media studies, and certainly there were very few people who, were care who cared about race and gender in these areas. And so she's uh, one of the first voices that I read uh, working in this area, so it's, um, I can say that she has influenced and is, and is still influencing these conversations and emergent scholars um, in a substantive and foundational way. So uh, it is both a pleasure and an honor for me to have her here today. Please welcome me in joining her. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I mean, it is such an honor to be here and to kick off this great event. Um, I went to a small liberal arts college in Oregon, Reed, and being here reminds me so much of that. And it reminds me that I learned how to do research in college, not in graduate school. And it was the model of my professors and mentors and the intellectual community that was there and that was intimate and small and, and did cool things. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to give a talk that is not about video games, which is very rare for me because I've been writing about video games almost exclusively for two years, but I felt like this was important and I had to write about it. Um, it came out of a talk I gave at American Studies Association where I tried to talk about the state of the field in digital media studies and race and gender, and I listed two things as being really hard to study. Um, one of them is social networks, like Facebook, because it's really hard to get permission to look at people's personal things. It's really hard to show your own personal things. It's difficult methodologically for us to know how to analyze social networks, but we have to, right? Because these are exactly where people are spending their time. It was very foolish of us not to want to do that. It'd be like not studying television in the 80s, right? You'd be really losing out if you weren't to go there. And the other thing I wanted to say that's really hard to study is transnational digital media. Right, because there's all kinds of issues around translation and around understanding how um, images circulate and what they mean in different contexts. So I took the second one to heart and decided I would try to do it because I thought it was hard. <laughs> so the result may partly reflect that. Um, so what makes social media social? Industry pundits like Tim O'Reilly, the tech publisher who wrote the famous essay that first coined the term, what is Web 2.0? This was in 2001, I believe. Um, and academics like Henry Jenkins have defined the term social media to include all digital media that spreads virally between users on shared networks. So rather than being broadcast by an industry, say, users share them between each other. Viral video like Gangnam Style, which I bet you had some flash mobs of, this being a campus, um, pictures of cute animals giving advice, other funny attention-getting visual media circulate on networks like Facebook, having found their way there, um, from image boards, YouTube, and people's own computers. 
and Well Geert Loving, Tiziana Terranova, and Jody Dean, who are all post Marxist digital media um, kind of political economists, um, have a really strong critique that disagrees with the idea that social media is a laborless form of labor or free labor, because Jenkins really kind of subscribes the idea that this is play, it's not really work, um, you know, it's not wait, it's not. It shouldn't be paid in the same way other labor is. Um, what both schools of thought agree upon absolutely um, is what has value. So they don't know whether it should be monetized or who should profit, but they all agree what has value in social networks, and that is pictures. Pictures and, to a somewhat lesser extent, video. And this has always been so um, from well before the social web. In 1998, a period when there was a really big gender divide in the US and in Europe, um, in 2000, um, Toon van Dyck wrote that Dutch women have significantly lower possession skills and use of ICTs than men. And I'm come back, gonna come back to the digital um, gender divide shortly. Um, anthropologist Don Slater found that the most highly valued and actively traded forms of content between users on IRC, which was one of the early, early digital networks, um, that permitted anonymity were sex pics. So there are nude pictures either of the individuals themselves or just other people. So trading pics, was a way for users to get to know each other, to anchor a virtual body in a real body, um, but mainly to relate or network through the traffic and images and the creation of archives um, on one's own computer. Um, so to this day, porn, humorous images, or shocking images have always had the most value in social networks and travel the most promiscuously on image boards. And I would say IRC is not used as much as it was, it's still around, um, but image boards like 4chan, Reddit, Imager, Photobucket have really come to replace IRC is where a lot of conversation happens. So most of the images that go viral that we see eventually on our Facebooks and Twitter come from these places. And these are places where users send rank and most importantly resend or recirculate noteworthy images. Um, so uncanny, exciting, unusual images like the manta ray photo bomb, which I'm not gonna show, which some of you know. It's a picture of three women in a manta ray coming up behind them. It's just amazing. Of course that's gonna go everywhere. Um, I think that was first, that first appeared in Imager. So these are some of the most traffic sites in the internet. And as Monroy Hernandez has written, they're prolific meme factories. So NPR said 2012 was the year of the meme. And if NPR finally is catching up to social media, it really must be the year of the meme, if even they say that's true. Um, they're really behind the curve on the internet. But, you know, obviously it's, it's the case. I mean, people are talking about memes all the time. Um, and so though nobody pays for images, the currency that's most desired and demanded in exchange for rare or unusual images is more images. So trading, right? So Monroy Hernandez was monitoring 4chan a really infamous image board where people, um, where that doesn't keep archives. So users often preserve folders on their own desktops for future enjoyment or remixing. And I'm gonna be talking about that. So um, one user said he wanted to shock a friend and he asked for a, he said, I wanna shock a friend, um, I'll give you an image of a cat in return. So I'll give you a cat, right? So it's a trade, right? There's a um, traffic in images, rare, surprising, funny cats, really prized in this economy. Um, and have been celebrated as spreadable media. So no one can exactly say what makes an image, a dance, a song go viral. Usually popularity is unintentional. People will try very hard to reduplicate their original success. Um, but the most prized images are spectacular, literally. They provide visible evidence of the impossible, the rare, the baffling. In the case I'm gonna discuss in this paper, the racially abject. So I'm gonna make a controversial claim in response to Jenkins's off-quoted phrase, if it doesn't spread, it's dead. He's implying that that's a good, that's, that would be bad if it died, right? It should spread. Um, I'm gonna say that there are some memes that should die. <laughs> but no one knows how to kill viral media, right? It has the same problems as other kind of viruses. It's difficult to know how to get rid of them. Um, just as no one knows how to make it go viral, no, no one knows how to get rid of it. Um, but I'm going to talk about some of the moral or ethical Im um, imperatives as to why we might want to devote some time to thinking about this. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some of the cuter or more appealing memes to start with um, in recent years. You might have seen this one, dog shaming. Um, these are images of people's pets. They make a sign, they put it right next to the pet. And this peaked in popularity in winter 2012, so I'll just show you some more. 
<laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> there are, you know, about a hundred of these, and they really became popular um, right over in Christmas 2012, and has dropped off quite a bit, but it's still viewed. And of course, because this is a, a mimetic culture, um, gave rise to cat shaming. <laughs> Not quite as popular because cats, as we know, don't feel shame. <laughs> um, but it also gave rise to other forms of shaming, which look exactly the same. It's a person, this time, holding up a sign, covering their face because of the shame, right? But confessing to it at the same time. And here's another one. Okay. So these are cute, right? And these all came after um, dog shaming. But here's another one that's a little more disturbing. This is child shaming, and I'll read you what it says. You want, has anyone seen this image? It appeared in the Huffington Post. Um, a, a journalist named Rashonda Billingsley decided to punish her daughter, um, who posted a picture of herself or, or some content of herself talking about drinking, though she's underage. And what this says is, since I want to post photos of me holding liquor, I'm obviously not ready for social media, and will be taking a hiatus until I learn what I should be, what I should and should not post bye bye. And so you can't see the girl's face, obviously. Her mother doesn't want to put that up, but you can see she's crying. And so she forced her to put this up on the child's Facebook, right, as a form of public shaming. And this has gone viral as well. I mean, you can see images of kids standing on the freeway showing signs saying that, you know, I stole from the convenience store, I'm a bad person. Um, if you want to know more, call this number and they'll put the, the father's cell phone number. Um, there's also a viral video of a man shooting his daughter's laptop because she posted some unflattering things about the way he was treating her. So um, this is a little crueler, obviously, than dog and cat shaming and even grad student shaming. Um, but this, there's, a, there's a visually networked shaming of children and dogs that's preceded by even more serious shaming. Um, as early as 2008, internet users dubbing themselves scam baiters have deployed this meme to shame 419 scammers. In other words, people who try to trick internet users, usually by spamming them with requests to wire $5 million to a Nigerian bank. Um, so in order to waste time and resources of the scammers, um, internet vigilantes like scam baiters um, publicly expose the scammer. That's what they plan to do as well as to tell the authorities. And so as they write in their websites, they do it out of a sense of civic duty as a form of amusement or both. Um, they view these as forms of justified retribution. And so here's an example of a picture that a man was forced to take um, to satisfy a, a European or American um, scam baiter who was trying to involve him in this endless waste of his time to punish him for trying to trick people out of their money. Um, as Fun Finn Brunton writes, 419 scammers write victims' emails begging the receiver's assistance in exchange for a large sum of money needing only an upfront payment or access to a bank account. So you probably receive scam email that's asked you to forward money to this or that. Sometimes it's a Nigerian bank, sometimes it's a Russian bank, it could be lots of ones, but really Nigeria is the one that's usually associated with this. Um, as Brunton writes, these scams still produce, res produce results despite the fact we all know them um, because the story of the Nigerian president who needs the use of a US or European bank account to get his money out of the country um, attest to the intractability of the political problems that still characterize Africa to non-Africans. So in the section of his book entitled, You Know the Political Situation in Africa, he writes that 419 scams are part of an enormous narrative about the failures of globalization from which you, the reader, can profit. And they're often posed in that way, right? The government is so corrupt, you have an opportunity to benefit so they kind of exploit the greed and also the, you know, the kind of negative notions about Africa that most people tend to have. Um, now, 419 is a serious crime. In 2008, uh, Matthew Zook published an article claiming that $3.1 billion were lost as a result of these scams. Um, it's also damaged the, um, the brand equity of Nigeria, according to Durkin, who's an anthropologist, stigmatizing the Nigerian people as untrustworthy and unscrupulous, of course, even those who don't participate. Um, in exchange for the chance to earn money from an unsuspecting Westerner, Jenna Burrell has written, many Africans rationalize or explain the activity as an expression of vigilante justice rather than truly a crime. Um, one man she interviewed who had thought about scamming and hadn't actually done it said, because they can't go to America, they will take money from Americans, seen as a victimless crime. 
Um, indeed, Scambader trophy videos are, in pictures, are, in Burrell's words, another space where the complex and problematic conditions of post-coloniality and embodied identity are played out. Um, so she describes uh, 419 scams as a weapon of the weak, part of a bargain between four poor vigilantes um, in Africa and less poor, if not rich, vigilantes, both engage in scamming the other. And so I'm going to be talking about the traffic in images and how that operates here. So where do these images come from? What are they? Why do they look like this? Right? Um, the shaming meme has found its way, I would argue, from here in 2008 into the things we're seeing in 2012, right? holding the sign. Um, I call this the digital pillory. It depicts a living being holding an embarrassing sign, which we remember from medieval times. Um, dog shaming and child shaming are iterations of that, but I think it really has its origin here. Um, 419 Eater claims to be the largest scam baiting site on the internet, and it was started in 2003. So it is extremely old. It has thousands of posts um, in providing FAQs, uh, tutorials, legal advice, sample letters that would help would-be scam baiters lure the victims effectively. It even has a mentoring program. If you want to learn how to trick African and other foreign scammers into talking to you and sending them pictures, wearing watermelons and wearing bras and stuff, it will tell you how to do that. It gives you model letters for how to do it. Um, the trophy room of 419 Eater, a site that has over 48,000 registered members, is devoted to displaying the hundreds of posed photographic self-portraits that these advanced free fraud scammers have been tricked into making. So there's video, there's mostly pictures. Um, some men have been tricked into getting tattoos either of the name of the person scamming them or of some other ridiculous, humiliating thing, and then they have to show the tattoo. Um, as the site states, baiting or tricking these scammers into performing these acts constitutes both appropriate punishment and good fun or sport. So um, this is another site. There's a, several, but this is another one. Um, and you can see, or you will see, rather, that this image of making people do a milk baptism comes back. Like There's dozens of images that show that in particular. Um, or posing nude, right? A lot of people are made to pose nude. Um, they're almost all men, and I'll talk about why that is later. Um, and here's a rare one, 419bader.com actually depicts a woman who they also tricked into posing nude and holding a sign, right? So Graham Parker, the artist, explains the sport of baiting scammers. Starts, by, starts out by the American hearing the scammer's pitch, then answering with some queries of his own. Um, he establishes his credentials as a man to be taken seriously. Um, then he claims to be troubled by the idea he might be talking to a machine. He wants to go up the chain of command. He wants to know he's speaking to a person. So he proposes a Turing test. The American sent the Nigerian an email asking him to photographically recreate an attached image or a painting as confirmation that a human is reading as, and processing his communication. So um, here's a an image of what the trophy room looks like. So this man has been tricked into holding this sign for the trophy room. Um, I had to join this community, by the way, to study it, which is really weird. <laughs> but I'm one of the 48,000 people. And here's an image from Graham Parker's, which is amazing. And they sent, um, so the scam baiter sent a picture right here with Elvis, Marilyn Monroe, Humphrey Bogart, and asked these scammers to recreate them as evidence that they were not bots, right? That they were real human beings, and they did. So these are, you know, three different groups of people, and they all went through this kind of charade in order to convince this individual that they were serious. Um, so here's a detail from um, the FAQ for 419. It says, what is scam baiting? You put simply, you enter into a dialogue with scammers simply to waste our time and resources. While you were doing this, you'll be helping to keep scammers away from real potential victims and screwing around with the minds of deserving thieves. Um, it doesn't matter if you are new to the sport or a hardened veteran. Um, and then it goes on to say, even if you are a newcomer, much fun can be had. And at the same time, you'll be doing a public service. So a lot of the rhetoric is around sport and fun. Right, getting, having a good time at the expense of these scammers. Um, obviously, they're aware that almost all the images in the trophy room are of African men. And they're aware that this looks racist. Um, the trophy room screen explains it should also be noted scam baiters do not actively seek scammers of a particular skin color. We only engage thieves who send us emails trying to steal from us. We do not target any particular type of person or country. However, the images tell their own story. 
Photographs of Africans holding signs that say things like King of Retards, which you saw, or I like to give head, are designed to render their holder abject, and as I will argue, also primitive. So I'm going to show a trophy video, and then I'll show a series of images that look very much like this. Um, so here's a trophy video that I found on YouTube of two men who were asked to make this particular video with a carrot strapped to the side of the head, were bras, diapers, and milk baptism. So a lot of the comments here find this hilarious. They think this is so funny. Um, and then somebody wrote and said, do you know that these are scammers who are being made to do this to trick them? And others said, I hate scammers. They are so awful. You know, they deserve everything that they get. And here's another image from the trophy room that someone was made to take, which is a milk baptism. So there's a visual culture of this kind of trickery, which is really persistent um, because people teach each other how to do it, right? And so. Um, there are some images that come back, such as men have, being forced to wear bras. That seems to be common. Um, diapers or skirts are really common. Holding something in the mouth, like a pickle, which you just saw in the video. Um, this image appeared in um, a website called F is for Fun. And the title of it is Post Funny Pictures, Part 4. So um, this is an amazing image, right? It, not surprising that people would want to see it. Um, now, when Jenna Burrell studied Ghana, which is not the same as Nigeria, but also has some issues with 419, um, what she saw is that for these users, um, many of whom admitted trying scams or new people who had, um, most of the time when they were trying to meet with foreigners or speak to them, it was not to scam them. It was to um, make connections with them, as she says. Uh, uh, they use cyber cafes to um, find people who might want to help them subsidize an education, um, were attracted to each other in order to have conversation or to practice English and so on. These were not always exploitative relationships in every case. Okay, so I'm going to skip ahead of this guy. So these trophy photos have circulated all over the internet, appearing on image boards like F is for Funny, Jaw Drops, Harmony Central, you name it. I mean, there's hundreds of iterations of this image in, in particular where they're eagerly discussed and consumed by huge numbers of users, many of whom have no idea of where these images came from. Uh, memes are defined as such because they move into multiple context discourses and networks quite seamlessly, iterating as often and seemingly, you know, as much as possible without anybody's particular effort. Um, social media is intermingled with medic culture. The share button has become utterly native and expected on almost all image viewing applications on smartphones, image boards, social networks, and so on. So if you own a smartphone of any kind, the share button is, is kind of coded on board with the camera, right? And with every other image app that you have, the idea is that you will iterate these memes. And you see something you like, you'll send it to everybody you know, whether you know where it came from or not, right? Most of the time we don't know where these things came from. Um, so how is it possible that the scam baiting shaming meme is not viewed as racist? Well, child shaming was very controversial. A lot of people thought that was utterly wrong to make your child pose with a sign like that. But you know, the reaction, at least based on what I've seen in these boards, is like, good for you, right? Punish these guys, these guys are terrible. Um, how does memetic culture work to diffuse the recognition of the most egregious racism under the sign of user-generated vigilantism? To what extent is the vigilante invisibly coded as white and male? Why are these not vigilantes? <laughs> Why are the other people vigilantes? Um, well, vi internet vigilantism can take many forms, and Gabriella Coleman's book, Coding Freedom, is about um, specifically uh, hacker communities, um, who often are kind of gray or white hat hackers who are vigilantes as well. Scam beating almost always takes the form of requiring Africans to perform primitivism to image themselves as professional savages, to use Rosalind Poignant's term. As Matthew Zook puts it, the photographic trophies on 419 Eater, quote, trick scammers into making photos of themselves holding sexually explicit signs that are then used to publicly ridicule and humiliate them. 
So here's another um, iteration <laughs> of this very, the same image from a, a, a funny image website called Jaw Drops and it's called Tickle My Pickle, right? People thought this was hilarious again. And um, here's one from Harmony Central, which is a, a message board for music lovers, right? So this stuff goes every, that's why it's viral, it goes everywhere. <laughs> um, no one knows what it is, however. Right, the invitation is please caption this photo. And so people make up these hilarious captions, you know, about playing jump rope and so on, and then someone finally says, I think this is a picture of scammers that a scam baiter forced these guys to make. And then the, re then the refrain is, thank God I hate those guys. Right, they totally deserve to be punished. Thank God someone's looking out for our interests because, you know, obviously the US government isn't doing a good job. Um, so the 419 scammer is not the only kind of internet-based fraudster there's lots around. Um, but as I've written elsewhere, the digital engenders a desire for the culturally familiar and the primitive, primitive to anchor a sense of loss of control. Right? The social media environment makes people often feel like they're in a state of present shock that's both desired and feared. Right? That no one feels they're keeping up, including me. Everyone feels that they're, um, they both desire and um, really despise the feeling of being nowhere in time in mimetic space, right? Kind of lost in these images, swimming in them, drowning in them. Um, as Parker speculates, the rage um, against the scam baiter is informed partly by fear that globalization is making it possible for objects that were far to come too close, to invade our space, to compete in a global marketplace made too small. When scam baiters are made to produce abject media, and here's another iteration of it, um, this is said, to be one of the greatest scam baiting picks ever, pretty funny for more alas and more on the whole 419 scam and how to protect yourself, go to 419 eaters, right? Um, so when scam baiters are made to produce this kind of media, which then becomes part of the grist that allows the mill of social media to grind without us, we are witnessing a new form of imperial power in the post-digital age. The form of photographic production seen in the trophy room is likewise, likewise often appears surreal, bizarre, baroque, a formation of the capture of vernacular photography by the memetics of shaming. However, it is not an appropriation of a new imaging technology that's produced a new aesthetic convention. And what's shocking to me is that the convention is purely an exercise in power for its own sake. Um, these are not unintelligible or nonsensical, funny behaviors, but rather they are exactly the primitive in ways that are designed to counter the perception of Nigerians as sophisticated information aid subjects. So it's a way to kind of contain Africa and say, well, they're not really smarter than us, right? They're not really taking a billion of our dollars. We're the ones who are advanced. These are the people who are not. Um, the symmetrical in arrangement of Africans as decorative objects arranged in a tableau on either side of an ob another object, in this case an African, is what I call the, you know, the kind of mimetic classic primitive, right? It travels along networks like artworks, advertising, and other media channels, and has now found its way into 419 Eater. And it's kind of amazing, wearing diapers, bras, pickles in their mouths, um, milk uh, baptisms, simulating, you know, the simulating fellatio, obviously the milk baptism has got something to do with um, some kind of queering abject discourse very much a spectacle of a, of a queer primitive, right? Which is painstakingly recreated in image after image. Um, African men and women, the scammers that scam baiters harass, are tricked into sending these pictures of themselves posing with signs, um, getting tattoos, making videos of themselves, slapping each other with fish. They are in the strange position of performers or artists for Europeans and American patrons they will never meet or see. So in many ways, this is like 18th century colonial <laughs> kind of portraiture, right? They're posing for people who they will never know. Um, and it's by no, by no means a new thing for Western audiences to force Africans, Filipinos, Aborigines, and other subaltern groups to perform themselves as primitive when they really are not. So think about the World's Fair, where they had to set up native villages for Filipinos who were going out to get hot dogs as soon as they could, right? <laughs> um, so modernity is defined by the promiscuous proliferation of images formerly separate by space, separated by space. The traffic between sites distant and at one time unconnected, the vastness of the space between production and reception of the image was at one time a sign of its technological reach. Um, Christopher Pinney and Rosalind Poignant, film, film scholar Fatima Maroney, and Jeffrey Batchin have all written about how photography and film created a visual culture of the native, right? That that was what modernity was, was to move between these distant sites using technology. Um, 
However, the shaming or pillorying of suspected scammers using these very specific visual primitive um, conventions, the performance of objection while holding a homemade sign, the performance of professional savagery has truly become a mimetic practice. I mean, you can see it you know, in the shaming meme and in the images I showed you of dogs. Okay, so I'm gonna finish with a section called Africa, Women and the Second Digital Divide. Almost no women appear in the trophy room. The vast majority of scam baiting occurs between wider European men um, and African men. In some ways, this is not a surprise, for the digital gender divide in Africa is extreme. It has been dubbed the second digital divide. A report commissioned by Intel and released in 2013 found that on average, 23%, 23 fewer women than men are online in developing countries. This is most true in sub-Saharan Africa. This represents 200 million fewer women than men who are online today. So while the gender gap in the US and in Europe closed around 1998, um, in the rest of the world, it is extreme, right? There are far, far more men online than there are women. This image of an African woman was found on 41 on Eater, and I included it because it was so exceptional. It simply says, I will do everything that I am asked. Well, most other images in the archive depict men in ridiculous positions, wearing fruit or vegetables, outlandish costumes, women's clothes, performing silly acts, this one stands out in its frank and honest depiction of how the traffic in mimetic digital images on social networks is truly generated, how the sausage is made. This image did not go viral, <laughs> unlike the three men holding pickles. Indeed, it fails to meet any of the requirements of viral video or viral images. The image attests to the power of the meme to visualize accurately an intensely unequal power relation. It is not viral because it is not shocking. It is not surprising, it is not at all funny, it is simply sad. As Kara Keeling has written, the Afrofuturist movement is a response to catastrophe, the catastrophe of slavery, abduction, and later neo-imperialism. Africa is part of the traffic in memes, but as is the case with coltan, an absolutely essential mineral in the production of video games, mobile phones, and so on, these images are not extracted as resources, or these, rather these images are extracted as resources, but do not produce value in their own local context. So these are export resources, right? They are taken out, but not um, used in, in the place where they come from. I do not believe the images circulate and are prized or viewed as hilarious on African image boards. Africa's role, at least in these viral images, reflects, quote, their disadvantaged position within society and the world using the very representation of Africa defined apart from and against them by hegemonic forces. And that's Burrell again. We need a social media image ethics that acknowledges the conditions of production of memes and their operation within an intention economy of racial and gendered abjection. And so, though there are a few, few images of women, I mean, all the images of men are ex extremely demeaning sexually, right? Um, media scholarship needs to explore the genealogy, distribution, aesthetics, and visual history of mimetic culture, so much of which is racist, sexist, and comes in no context, from no context that we can see in particular. It's very hard to kind of forensically unearth where these things are from, right? It's a kind of archaeological project that most of us don't really know how to do. Um, what channels do these things travel through? Where do they come from? They leave no clear trails. As Coco Fusco wrote in regards to photography, Race exists partly to be seen, to be consumed. Race is itself spectacular. As we move, and actually have already moved from paper to screens, the origins of these images matter even more than they did with paper, for they have wandered even farther and more radically out of context than their predecessors did. Racial violence is absolutely the foundation for these images, as they are for the Antoine Dodson music video, the auto-tune the news one. I'm not going to show up, but you know, it was very popular two years ago. Um, as it is for other spectacular images of people of color, often queer men or men queered by the image economy of scam baiting. Well, a very few commenters on these boards where the pickle and diaper image appeared protested its overt racism. Most just gloated at how great it was that this image existed at all how funny it was, how just the punishment of would-be scammers. A digital media archeology span that would investigate or at least acknowledge the conditions of racial coercion and enforce primitivism that gave rise to these pictures would at least give the viewer a chance to reflect on what the like or share button really does, how it performs race and gender in the late age of capital and the social networking economies that reflect it. Thank you.
mean, I mostly thought that we'd have a bit of a conversation and uh, take a lot of questions, hopefully. Um, so in just thinking about what you've said here today, there are four terms that I just that keep circulating as I'm listening to this. Uh, so one of those terms is play, um, voice, bodies, and games. Mm -hmm. Of course, games are always on, on my mind in some way, but it sort of relates to play, the, the, the game thought. Um, but as far as play is concerned, right away I can hear a defense mm -hmm. that um, this is play culture, right? One of those sort of um, knee-jerk almost defenses and, and lines in these sort of discourses of, of play, that this is play culture, this mm -hmm. is a form of play. But I think what your work on this does, and I've never thought of shaming in this way, the culture of shaming in this way at all. Um, a lot of this is, is new to me, uh, which will get to, I think, my second, my second term, voice. Uh, but at least with this, what you're doing is drawing out some of those primitive implications mm -hmm. in play spaces, mm -hmm. right? So that's something that I think uh, we, we could do more of, is to talk about the role of the primitive, to talk about the role of violence, right, all kinds of violence in play, and I think that's something that's missing from those discourses in general, right? It's, either, it's, it's an either or, it's like either it's labor or it's play, mm -hmm. but this work uh, and this topic touches on both of those things, both labor and play, in a way that draws our attention to the violence of play mm -hmm. in these spaces too, or what we construe as play. Yeah. Um, and, and I think definitely technology, uh, and the use of technology and the internet just gives us different inflections of that kind of thing, these things merging together. Uh, as far as voice is concerned, I kept thinking a lot about how uh, this is such a, a visible, a hyper-visible and invisible stream of things, right? That, that um, it's around and it's available to, to look at, but there are ways in which there's no lasting conversation or discourse around that. Even if you've seen the circulation of these pictures, it's one of those things, one of those sort of tools of modernity that is both visible and invisible. And we, and we think about that when we think about race and racialized bodies as well. Uh, but with voice, I was thinking in particular, especially in looking at the images and the videos about the people who are doing the scamming, um, and their voice in the conversation. Now, I know you, you mentioned NPR uh, at the onset, and I think actually it was on NPR that I heard a series of interviews with Nigerian um, women who were involved in scams. And I th it was This American Life, I'm sure, uh, that, that's somewhere in their archive of, of things. Um, and it was the first time I thought about that, but wh I, I, what I'm sort of intrigued by is the voice and the response of those scammers or so-called mm -hmm. scammers in this discourse. Mm -hmm. And in looking at some of your pictures and the videos, I kept thinking, wow, I wonder what they're saying. Like that picture where the, pe the people are behind uh, the, the, the men um, with the pickles, oh, yeah. and they're all sitting there. And yeah. so I wonder what their participation is. What are they saying? What are they thinking about this? Do they have the same kind of reaction that we have to these pictures? And I think what I'm maybe um, hoping for is uh, just a more complicated uh, resistance, this, these voices of resistance and these yeah. possibilities of resistance. And again, I guess it gets, uh, draws our attention to who's the vigilante, mm -hmm. right? And, and it makes me want to think about internet scams in a whole new way, mm -hmm. right? The successful scammer is, is, is imploding some of this, uh, this imperialist, um, these elements of imperialist control. If they're able to succeed and they don't read it, these images, the way we read these mm -hmm. images, there is room for this sort of resistant presence. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking that and looking at the people behind who are sort of stoically sitting there. I would have to look at the image a little longer. Uh, but certainly I thought about that with the last, uh, the picture of the woman mm -hmm. um, and her, uh, what I would maybe think of as anger, just her whole demeanor. And I want to hear those voices mm -hmm. and bring those into the conversation. So I don't know if you know of people who've mm -hmm. done any work on actually tracking or talking to the people who have been involved in scams, mm -hmm. but also even the people who are in these pictures. Is right. that an even possible approach? Uh, because it seems like it could add something to this, this conversation. Um, and so, so yeah, with bodies, I think a lot of the things that you're saying about the erotic and the sexual dimensions of this imagery is important, um, and its relationship to kind of porn and kind of pornography-like mm -hmm. aesthetics, yeah. right? With a predominantly assuming, I'm assuming, male audience on the boards, right? Mm -hmm. Male pe males who are posting the pictures and consuming the pictures, and so I kept thinking of this as another um, instance of the pornographic, um, you know. Yeah, so I, I, kept, I kept thinking of it in, in that particular way, and the fact, as you point out, that there aren't as many pictures of women involved in this, that it's, that it's um, male to male. To male. 
Um, and then finally, with games, uh, I, can, I also think about, um, and this is related to the play point, but the, the violence of uh, social networking and how that shows up in game culture, right? Which also has a culture of trophy, trophies and d digital avatars and trophies of bragging and shaming, right? One-upping and trolling and all of the sort of racist uh, conversations that take place in those spaces and thinking of this as an extension of that. And something like the meme, I know you're right about the Sims, um, even in the Sims now, you can show, your Sims can show uh, other Sims, um, these sort of gross and disturbing videos. You don't see them, but you see the Sims like showing them, look at my gross video. And then, you know, it's, it was sort of, they're simulating like puking that uh -huh. they're watching that, but there's pleasure in that. Yeah. So I don't know if you've thought about game culture and something like this too. I know you think about games a lot uh, as well, but that kept, kept jumping out at me. But um, hopefully you have some thoughts about some of this. And I know the people here also will have some things to say. But yeah, I'm floored and just trying to absorb um, all that you're saying. Yeah, yeah well, thank you. Um, Kendra had exactly 12 hours <laughs> in my essay because I was writing it up to last night because I had to change parts of it because of other things. And so I'm totally impressed you were able to have just that thinking about sophisticated it. take on it. And, um, you know, it is really hard to study this kind of material because it's almost impossible yeah. to find the people who are in the images and you have to wonder ethically is it right for me to try to find them yeah right like that's a big mm -hmm. kind of you know researcher question like if people are engaged in somewhat illegal activities and are being humiliated in a very public forum to boot is it even your right to try to get a hold of them in any way um, i relied on burrell's work because she interviewed people in internet cafes in ghana um, who some of whom were scammers so mm -hmm. she talked mm -hmm. to people which i have not yeah. But I think that reading the images more deeply or working them a little harder to see yeah. what the role of the audience is in some cases with right. these public displays or performances of you know, slapping or milk and so on. Um, I read them as abject, but you're entirely correct. I mean, people to, who can't read the signs, mm -hmm. right? They might have been told, hold up the sign, but do not know what it says may be very much like the animals in the pictures in the beginning, where there's a, an image and the, you know, the animal has no idea what it says. I mean, certainly not to compare people to animals in that way, but that, you know, um, shame is partly about publicity. It's not always about internalizing a position of objection, right? You can be shamed and not know it. This has happened to everybody when the toilet paper gets stuck to your shoe, right? I mean, in some ways, that's the worst kind of shame because the publicity is there without the actual ability to remedy, mm -hmm. right? And so people have asked me before, do you think these scammers know their pictures are up? If they yeah. don't, how is it harmful? And I thought, I don't know if they know. I assume they can use the internet well, right? Which is why they're here. Maybe they know about these sites. They could know about them. But it's impossible to know how they would feel about them, right? Because for them, this is a job. Right, so the whole point of scamming is that it's a survival tactic. It's no one's chosen career. I mean, no one decides to do that as their first option. It is always because an education in computers or a, a desired job in some other industry doesn't materialize, mm -hmm. right? And so this is absolutely a kind of career of last resort for many people. Um, and it's a lot more porous boundary than people think. Like, as we all says, many people think about it and don't do it. Or they maybe do it one time and they never do it again. Right, so it's not this really black and white kind of thing. Yeah, it seems um, really hard. Yeah. I, I just keep wanting to think that there's some element of the return scam that's uh -huh. possible there in the, in the photograph. And maybe this is just my own, and me imposing this wish on the culture, on the image, but just even for people who aren't re aware of what the sign says and, whether, and, and having the pickle and all of that, that is there, what I'm curious about, and this is uh, something that may be impossible to know, is is there a sort of conscious is this a continuation of the scam yeah. right we're playing into your imperialist perceptions of the primitive right. it, it doesn't mean the same thing to me as it does to you right. and so here you want me to pose in this way does it have the same thing is this a part of um getting you know is, is it is, is it can it still function as a mode of resistance right. even as we read it as you know a part of the shame culture um, that's, really that's a hope. That's a hope and, a, and, a, and just a question. You know, does that exist? Especially when I look at sort of some of the, the looks of defiance, mm -hmm. right, on the faces. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's not defiance. Maybe it's, it's not exactly that. But yeah, that's what I, 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 yeah. I wonder about you know, this part. Anthropologists 
so good at talking about this. Like there is a wide range of professional <laughs> savagery going from Ishii yeah. all the way up to like the Filipino mm -hmm. tribesmen, sure. who were making a pretty decent salary, would leave work and go to New York and ride the you know Coney Island Ferris wheel. And thought they were having the greatest time ever. Like it was, you know, tourism for them. Right. And there's a lot of professional savagery in between. And so it's really hard to know mm -hmm. what this is. But that's what digital media does. It takes things out of their context and right. makes it very difficult to understand the situation in which they were made and the intentions that were involved in their making. Yeah. Right. So we can know a little bit about the economy of why this was done, but we can't know. Did they succeed? Right. Did they get yeah. the money? You know, uh -huh, uh -huh. was it yeah. who won? Like, there's no really no way to say. All right. you have is this artifact, which to us speaks really eloquently of old-fashioned kinds of mm -hmm. abjection, but as you say, could very well have been part of a larger story of successful African entrepreneurialism. Yeah, no idea. And there's no way to know. Um, and by the way, it was a woman who posted the fish video, uh -huh. and she was a, an outspoken racist. Okay. Right, biological racist, saying, you know, Africa is a primitive country. The people there are, are subpar of intelligence. Here's the evidence. Okay, wow. And wow. so yeah. she was very much, you know, on board with the mission to humiliate and to objectify. Again, that doesn't say that the people in the images felt that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's to say how that's how the meme was reproduced. Sure. As part of the sign of evidence around racial inferiority in the modern age as wow. opposed to the, the primitive age. Awesome.